In this lecture, we will be reviewing components of the periodontal assessment. Now, most of the information in this video should be familiar to you, so we should be able to move through it pretty quickly. There are two types of periodontal assessment. The first one would be PSR, which is a quick process to determine if a more comprehensive assessment is needed. And the other is a comprehensive periodontal assessment, which is much more in-depth. In this review, we're going to be discussing the components of a comprehensive periodontal assessment. Now, the components of the periodontium that we will be looking at when we assess a patient's condition would be gingival inflammation, level of free marginal gingiva, recession of the gingiva, level of the mucogingival junction, probing depth measurements, bleeding on probing. We also want to look at the presence of exudate, tooth mobility, furcation involvement, the presence of calculus deposits on the teeth, and the presence of dental plaque biofilm. The gingival description can give us clues toward whether the patient is healthy, has gingivitis, or has signs of periodontitis. When we evaluate the gingiva, we're looking for tissue color, contour, consistency, and texture. In our clinic manual under hygiene assessments, you will find gingival descriptors in each of these categories listed. Don't be shy to pull out that clinic manual or, or bring it up on your computer in clinic so that you can get the assessment correct. What kind of things might we see when a patient has gingival inflammation? Well, erythema. Uh, erythema is caused when blood flow increases at the site during the inflammatory process. And as that inflammation worsens, the gingiva can actually turn bluish red from the stagnation of blood in the vessels. Edema is swelling that is caused by flu fluid accumulation in the surrounding tissues. So edematous tissue may cause the inner dental papilla to become bulbous. Other signs of inflammation may include blunted or cratered papilla or fibrotic or retractable consistency. One thing that's really difficult for even a seasoned hygienist and dentist to remember is that the level of free marginal gingiva actually rests slightly above the CEJ in a normal and healthy mouth. Most of our patients' CEJ are covered by tissue. That makes probing a little more challenging at times, and our evaluation of clinical attachment levels should take into consideration the normal resting position of a healthy marginal gingiva. When the gingiva is resting significantly coronal to the CEJ, then we have a true case of gingival enlargement. This can be caused by both disease factors and non-disease factors like hereditary and medications. Well, we typically document gingival recession much more accurate, accurately than a healthy gingival margin or even an enlarged gingiva. When the CEJ is exposed, it makes recording recession much easier. Make sure that you understand the difference between normal resting place of a healthy gingival margin, gingival enlargement, and gingival recession. Let's talk about probing depths. When we probe, we're measuring from the tip of the free marginal gingiva all the way to the base of the pocket. The pressure we should be using would be about 10 to 20 grams of pressure, but what does that really mean? Well, a good way to test your pressure is to use a probe on your nail cuticle. You'll feel the probe hit resistance, and if you keep pushing, you'll feel pressure and eventually discomfort. Ideally, we want to stop the probe when we meet resistance and before we cause discomfort. In an inflamed pocket, that's not always possible, but we should strive to keep our pressure adequate without overdoing it. The measurements should always be rounded to the nearest millimeter, and we always round up to the next whole number. So example, if we probe a 3.5, we're going to round this up to a 4, and we probe six sites for each tooth. Bleeding on probing occurs when the wall of the gingival pocket is ulcerated, which is why sometimes probing is painful even when you're being gentle. The bleeding can occur immediately in some cases, but we also see delayed bleeding. So when you probe, it's important that you go back and look at a quadrant after you've probed and check for any delayed bleeding that may need to be charted. When we talk about exudate, what we're really saying is that the pocket has pus. It's also sometimes called separation. So pus in a gingival pocket represents dead white blood cells and can only occur during an infection. The easiest way to detect exudate is actually by tissue manipulation. So you place your finger right above that gingival pocket, 
um, just like in this picture here, you can see the finger is being applied exteriorly at the base of that mesial pocket and then pushing that exudate out from under the gingival margin. And here, if you look closely, you can see the exudate present on the probe as it's exiting the pocket. Don't be afraid to push gently on the tissue to check for the presence of exudate, especially when you're seeing obvious signs of inflammation. It's much more common to see horizontal mobility in a patient over vertical mobility. If we use an adjacent tooth as a reference point, we can assess vertical mobility against a more stable tooth when available. Horizontal mobility refers to a tooth that moves more than one millimeter facial to lingual, and vertical mobility refers to a tooth that moves up and down inside the tooth socket, and generally when we see vertical mobility, it's on a tooth with advanced periodontitis. So you're going to want to make sure you're familiar with the different levels of mobility. You can find them in your clinic manual or you can review them in the text. You will be held responsible for accurately charting mobility in the clinic. Likewise, you're going to be responsible for charting furcation involvement, and you should be familiar with the classifications of furcation, which is also available to you in your clinic manual. Furcation involvement exists when periodontal disease has caused resorption of the bone into the bi- or trifurcated area of a multi-rooted tooth. We know that patients who present with active periodontitis often have subgingival calculus, but it's important to remember that calculus did not cause the periodontal disease. Calculus acts as a harborer of bacterial plaque, which then leads to infl an inflammatory immune response. So while calculus does not directly cause periodontitis, it does contribute to the disease process. Biofilm does directly contribute to the disease process. There are many different types of biofilms, and dental plaque is just one example. Biofilms can grow on uh, ponds, on the surfaces of ponds, on metals, plants, implanted medical devices, and other animal tissues. So dental biofilm is a highly resistant gathering of bacteria that has a propensity to develop inside a gingival pocket rather quickly. Biofilm formation begins when free-floating organisms come in contact with a surface and begin to produce a sticky substance which is made up of sugars, proteins, and nucleic acids, which enable the organism to stick together. That gooey substance is called a matrix, and once that matrix forms inside a gingival pocket, it must be removed mechanically. Patients can remove biofilm with good oral hygiene, but if a pocket has a calculus deposit which is harboring the biofilm, it will be nearly impossible to remove all of the biofilm until the calculus itself has been removed. Another thing we have to consider would be any dental restoration which is harboring biofilm, such as an overhanging margin or a poor crown margin. Sometimes the restorations must be redone in order to preserve the remaining periodontal structure or to prevent recurrent infection. As we discussed before, presence of plaque biofilm means that there is an infection of bacterial or other type of organism. In the mouth, we can identify biofilm using disclosing solution. So the dye, the red dye inside the disclosing solution is picked up by the plaque biofilm, making it more easily visible. This can really help you with patient education or if you're just trying to ensure that you've removed as much biofilm as possible. Plaque scores are a really excellent motivating tool for a patient. So if you are doing indices, for instance, you do indices before treatment, in the middle of treatment, and then at the end of treatment, it helps the patient see how what you're doing, your treatment, and what they're doing at home are really helping reduce that plaque. This is a really good but exaggerated example of radiographic bone loss. Bone loss won't always be this evident, but radiographic bone loss is an important part of the periodontal assessment. We're going to be discussing the use of radiographs in assessment of periodontal disease much more in depth during week three of this course. The attached gingiva lies between the free gingiva and the alveolar mucosa, extending from the base of the sulcus to the mucogingival junction. The width is not measured on the palate since it's impossible to determine where the attached gingiva ends and the palatal mucosa begins. The attached gingiva keeps the free gingiva from being pulled away from the tooth. Make sure that you are familiar with how to calculate the width of the attached gingiva. 
Cal is a very important measurement when it comes to periodontal assessment. If you need a refresher on how to calculate Cal, please review Ms. Norell's video on our YouTube channel, which is titled Professor Norell Explains Clinical Attachment Level. There you will find a step-by-step -step process of how the Cal is calculated. You will be responsible for properly calculating Cal in your didactic courses and in the clinic. So that's going to be the end of this review. In the coming weeks, we're going to go much more in depth with periodontitis. Make sure you have a good foundation moving forward so that you don't fall behind. See you next time.